So in this video, we're going to be looking at synapses, which are the gaps between neurons, which occur within the central nervous system, either within the spinal cord or within the brain. So you should have come across synapses um, when looking at the reflex arcs, because if you remember from the, what we know from the reflex arcs, that we go from the receptor to the sensory neuron, then across the synapse, which is in the central nervous system, to the relay neuron, then across another synapse, still within the central nervous system, to the motor neuron, which then goes to the effector, which causes the response. So we're going to be looking at how do does the action potential cross the synapse? We know from GCSE that it's to do with neurotransmitters, to do with chemicals, but we're going to look more precisely at that. So there are two types of synapses that we need to think about. The first one is called excitatory from the word excite. These allow an action potential to be stimulated in the postsynaptic membrane. So if you've got a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron, then an action potential that arrives in the presynaptic neuron will then be transmitted across and cause an action potential within the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, the most common neurotransmitter we're going to come across there is acetylcholine, but there are other ones as well. The second type of, neuro of synapse is an inhibitory synapse. Now, that means that when you have your presynaptic neuron and an action potential arrives, what will actually happen is that a neurotransmitter will be released, but there will be no action potential formed in the postsynaptic neuron, it inhibits it. Okay? And the common one we're gonna look at there is GABA, which although spe not specifically mentioned on the specification, often comes up in exam questions. So the action potential arrives at our presynaptic knob. So this area over here, from there to there, that is labeled the presynaptic knob. And my action potential, which is my depolarization, so it's positive, is going to arrive at my presynaptic knob, having been transmitted along the myelinated neuron in those small circuits. That will cause the calcium ion channels, which are these orange boxes I've shown here, they will now open. And because they open, that means that calcium ions can then diffuse through this channel. So it's a form of facilitated diffusion into the presynaptic knob, like so. And the job of those calcium ions is to cause these vesicles over here, shown in blue, which contain our neurotransmitter, it's to cause them to move to and fuse with. An important word there is fuse because a vesicle, if you remember, is made of a membrane and obviously the presynaptic membrane. It's also a membrane. So the phospholipid bilayer of the vesicle will literally join with the phospholipid bilayer of the membrane until it opens and releases its neurotransmitter uh, in the method of exocytosis, exo meaning out of the cell. So we now have our neurotransmitter being released outside the cell. That neurotransmitter will diffuse across the cleft. And when it diffuses across the cleft, it will bind to the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. Now remember that the neurotransmitter is a protein. Okay, because it's a protein, it has a very specific tertiary structure. 
held together by those bonds between the R groups. And that specific tertiary structure is complementary to the receptor. And that's really important because often questions will sort of hark back to what you know about proteins. So the neurotransmitter will bind to the receptor and that will cause the opening of sodium ion channels so that sodium ions can now diffuse through. And when sodium ions diffuse through, if we think of the graph of the process of nerve impulses, we know that it goes from negative through to positive, and that is called depolarization. So it will depolarize the postsynaptic membrane, forming an action potential. It's really important that you start to use terms like depolarization and action potential rather than just referring to nervous impulses, which is what we would call it at GCSE or electrical impulses. I want you to use the terms depolarization and action potentials because that's going to guarantee you the marks. Now, the neurotransmitter doesn't stay on there forever because if it did, then we'd stop being able to transmit any more impulses across um, that synapse. So what will happen to the neurotransmitter is that it will be broken down by an enzyme, it will be hydrolyzed, and that will then be taken back up by active transport into the presynaptic knob. It's one of the reasons why the presynaptic knob has lots of mitochondria, because there's gonna be active uptake of the products of hydrolyzing the enzyme. In addition, you're obviously going to have mitochondria because you've got sodium potassium pumps going on there to restore the resting potential, etc. So why did I talk about this binding? Well, one thing for us to think about while we're here is how drugs work. So drugs work by basically being a similar tertiary structure to the neurotransmitter normally, which means that a drug can bind to the, to the um, receptor in place of the neurotransmitter, which will then stop the impulses being traveled across and in the case of pain, therefore stop the pain. So two common questions. First one is how is a synapse unidirectional? Uni meaning one. In other words, why does it only travel in one direction? So again, if we go back and we think about our diagram, we can see that the vesicles containing the neurotransmitter are only found in the presynaptic neuron, and the receptors for the neurotransmitter are only found in the postsynaptic neuron. So it can only go in one direction. And then why are synapses important? So synapses is what you'll see are not always between just one neuron and the next. There may be several presynaptic neurons, which allow processing of information from different neurons and therefore different receptors. So you might see something, hear something, smell something, and all of that will come together to one synapse, and therefore you can coordinate a response towards it. So what about GABA? So it's something I mentioned right at the beginning with our inhibitory synapses. How does GABA work? So GABA is a neurotransmitter, as we said, it's released in an inhibitory synapse. So we've still got our little synapse going on here. So the basic method is the same. Action potential arrives, calcium channels open, calcium ions diffuse through. This causes the vesicles containing the neurotransmitter to migrate and fuse with the membrane, releasing the neurotransmitter by exocytosis. It can diffuse across the cleft. That's exactly the same as before. What's going to be different is the response to the neurotransmitter when it binds to its receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. So here is my neurotransmitter. It's going to bind like so. But this neurotransmitter this time, if you remember, is GABA. Now, why does that matter? Because what it does is it causes calcium ions to diffuse out of the postsynaptic knob and chloride ions to diffuse in, which makes the inside of the neuron 
very, very, very negative, which we called hyperpolarization. Now, that's a bit of a problem now, because if you think about the graph again, if we sort of just draw it down here for a little bit, okay? So this is the resting potential minus 70. What's happened is that now you've gone further down, you're sitting at, say there, hyperpolarized. And in order to get up to the minus 55 threshold potential, you're going to have to go much higher. You're going to have to see much a much bigger change in potential. So in effect, that means that you're going to need to take in more sodium ions into the postsynaptic membrane to be able to reach that threshold and therefore an action potential. So if you have an inhibitory synapse and an excitatory synapse um, coming basically to the same postsynaptic neuron, it's going to be the balance of the two. And we'll see that in a minute when we look at spatial summation. So summation, we're going to start by looking at temporal summation. So temporal summation, you have one postsynaptic neuron and one presynaptic neuron. So there we go. I'm going to make my impulse travel in this direction. So there is my pre and that is my post, like so. So the first action potential arrives. It causes the release of a neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter binds to its receptors, but it's not quite enough to reach the threshold. So if we're thinking about a graph here, like so, we've got our minus 70. So let's mark that as minus 70. We've got our threshold, but we're not quite there yet. We're not quite up to minus 55. And because of the all or nothing response of um, a nerve, therefore a neuron, nothing's going to happen at the moment. But if a little bit later, and we're talking milliseconds here, we now send another impulse down that end, we're going to release even more neurotransmitters, which combine to more receptors, which means that we might now get closer to the minus 55, and then if we send yet another one, make it blue. So we've sent three in a row. We're now gonna release even more neurotransmitters and that might be enough just to take us to minus 55 and therefore be enough to go up to the action potential and cause the action potential to be transferred across. So temporal means time. So it's the idea that you get a frequency of impulses and to provide the that provided that the frequency is high enough, an impulse will be transmitted across. If the frequency is not high enough, then there will be no impulse transmitted across. And this can give us an idea of it's sometimes of the strength of the stimulus, because remember, with the all or nothing response, you either ultimately get an action potential or you don't. So how does our body st distinguish from us touching the air? or touching something which is sharp, and it does it by frequency of impulses. Touching the air is not enough to send an impulse across um, this synapse. Touching something sharp is gonna be enough for the action potential to be caused in the postsynaptic knob. Okay, so the other type of summation is spatial. So spatial summation is when you have one postsynaptic neuron, like so, but leading into that postsynaptic neuron, you may have several presynaptic neurons and they may all be coming from different places. Now, this is what I was talking about before when I was talking about allowing you to coordinate your response by having different neurons coming from different places, causing the release potentially of neurotransmitters. So for example, I might have an action potential arriving down here, causing release of a neurotransmitter, which might be acetylcholine, which will diffuse across and bind to its receptors. That will by itself will probably not be enough to reach, to reach threshold. But if this managed to release acetylcholine as well from an action potential arriving here, then I might now get in, have enough um, neurotransmitter bind to my receptors to reach my threshold. But on the other hand, this one over here, this might be an inhibitory synapse, and that might release GABA, 
And we know before what GABA does is GABA makes it harder to reach the threshold. So it's going to be the combination that's going to determine whether we get an action potential in there or not. I'm going to illustrate it with this diagram. So we have three um, neurons coming in, A, B, and C. We've got one neuron coming out, which is D. And this is showing us what's happening in neuron D, the postsynaptic, when we have stimulus coming down, um, sorry, an impulse coming down A, B, or C. So we have an action potential forming in A there, but just A. Just A alone is not enough to cause anything in D, so nothing happens. And then I go on a little bit further in time. We've just got an action potential in B, not enough to do anything to form there. So nothing's going to happen here because we're not reaching the threshold. However, in time period two, we have an action potential there and an action potential in B. That is now enough to reach our threshold. So we've got one there and we've got one there. That's enough to reach our threshold. So we get an action potential in D. Likewise, later on in that time period, we've got A, we've got B, and again, we get D. So that's got two excitatory impulses, excitatory synapses, causing the action potential to form in D. But let's look what happens in time period three. In time period three, if you have a look at A, okay, so to begin with, if you look at it, we've only got something going on in C and nothing as a response. That doesn't really tell us anything because we probably wouldn't reach threshold in C of C alone anyway. The next one does tell us something. So we have an impulse coming, all right, we have an impulse coming down A, like so. That's coming that way. And we have an impulse coming down C, which is that one there. So they're at the same time, that one and that one. But there's nothing happening in D, which tells us that they can't be adding together. They can't be summing. We can't be reaching the threshold, which means that the C must be an inhibitory synapse, which is why we're not seeing an action potential forming in D. Because even though A may be releasing acetylcholine, C is probably releasing GABA, which therefore means we don't get an electrical impulse in D. We will talk more about this style of um, summation when we look at the eye and the structure of the neurons in the eye. That is it for this session.